in terms of what you pay as a rate payer, it's less because they have that much renewable energy in place. Important concept, confusing, but and you know everybody needs to understand this as part of moving this, this thing forward. Now, in terms of why clean programs work, it's also very often locally owned, and the Danes have a saying, which is our own pigs don't stink. You know, if you're out in the country, you're around farms, and you know, it can get pretty smelly, but if you're a farmer and you're doing that, you have pigs, and those pigs are bringing you your income and so forth, those pigs don't stink, you love those pigs. Depends on the farm. Okay, <laughs> but in any case, so that they, they have, they say that as a way of saying, you know, we're happy with our renewable energy, our wind farms, and so on and so forth in our communities. And once again, to go back to, to what's happening in Ontario, the degree to which the, it is community ownership. They have 40,000 applications for their microfit program for the small solar. They've got 8,000 contracts executed. There is a constituency in Ontario at this point for renewables. Whereas this is the United States, those green areas are IPPs, independent power producers, which are you know the folks that own the coal plants in Dunkirk and the coal plant in, in Somerset and, and so forth. It's largely large corporations, you know, that we have no say in whatsoever. Okay, another thing about the way that it's done in the United States, the production tax credit, the thing that make wind go like this, it's only applicable to um, it can't be used to offset salaries or wages. It's only applicable to what kind of income is that called? Um, discretionary disposable. No, no. There's a certain kind of income that, that no, and it's not earned. It's the opposite of earned. Okay, back to Germany. I'm trying to make this go fast. Passive income. That's what it is. So you know, you think great thing. We got tax credits. We're going to get wind energy, and it only goes to rich people that have this passive income. To, Against. This is a program in Ontario, you know, they have their own community bonds to buy renewable energy and to set up projects. That's the kind of thing that can happen when, when things pull together. Okay, in the United States, in, in New York at this point, there's an SREC program, and I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this at all. This is the solar program that we're talking about going forward in New York State. You know, it would be a positive thing but it's not going to get us where we need to go. We have to make sure that we don't lose fact, lose sight of a feed-in tariff or a clean program in getting this. Essentially, every time renewable energy or solar energy would generate power, there would be a credit that would be generated that if a utility wanted to buy it and the utility would be penalized if they didn't have enough of these, uh, you would get some, some cash for it. Um, and it has worked to some degree in New Jersey. This is solar in New Jersey versus solar in New York. That little teeny state of New Jersey, it's got all that much more solar. Um, but the goals under this thing are anemic. You know, it, for 2013 it would be 0.15 of 1% would be generated through solar. And in 10 years it would be 1.5%. Uh, you know, in Germany at this point they're talking about getting to 7% just on their solar. Hmm. So under this program, utilities that wouldn't get their quota of these SRACs would have to forfeit an alternative that would go to NYSERDA that would be pay, paying for renewables. And that's kind of what, you know, the, the stick along with the carrot that makes it work. The, a, a problem with it is that the utilities would be involved back in the generation business because they would be allowed to, to generate solar under this. At this point, there's kind of an arm's length thing and there's some competition. This would cut back on that. So it's a problem. This bill is a problem because it's only about solar, and as I mentioned, solar is one of the capacities, but we need all of them, and we need all going forward. Um, it's by far the most expensive commercially available, so it's gonna make renewables look more expensive than they need to. Um, a clean program could even deliver solar at a lower cost, and the target is anemic. So this, this kind of shows you relative to wind and solar. They're growing kind of at the same rate, but at this point, wind is generating 40,000 megawatts in the, in the United States, and solar is generating 2,000. Or at the point that was that graph was done in any case. Okay, so this is an estimate. There's the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that has done some great studies on all this stuff. They're saying that you know if we go ahead with this program, we're going to be able to do solar if we get it down to four dollars a watt for like 19 cents a kilowatt hour. 
whereas if we had a clean program or a, a fit program, we could be doing it at 16 cents. This is a comparison of the way Germany's prices for solar have tracked the actual cost of production in the United States. And Germany and the cost of production in the United States are right together through all those um, time period. And the New Jersey prices of the SREX are way off from that. Yes, New Jersey's program has worked. It's better than what we've got here, but it's still crazy compared to what it could be. So SREC is big They, they would buy, they would need to buy a certain, have a certain amount of renewable energy credit. So either they would generate them themselves or they would buy them from the public. And when they've got enough, this is what happens to the public that's generating it. The price goes way crashing down, which once again means that, you know, there's no stability for uh, setting up a manufacturing facility or whatever. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna do a conclusion. For environmental, labor, um, social justice organizations, the goals of an energy policy should to be to prevent, minimate, minimize and terminate negative environmental consequences and to grasp the opportunities to create sustainable jobs. And the more there is a constituency of folks who, ha who are working in the industry, of farmers who are able to keep their farms because they're generating some renewal, renewable energy, the more you have a political constituency to keep the thing moving forward in that positive direction. We have problems with the way energy is generated in the state. We have natural gas, which is threatening us with opening it up to hydrofracking. Mm -hmm. We have nuclear. You know, the Fukushima incident tells us what the problem is with that. The, the plants at Nine Mile Point in Oswego were recently found to have the same technology that they have in Fukushima. And they're under investigation at this point to see hmm. if they should be allowed to remain open. And Bill, just recently, and uh, I think it was Scientific America, one of the science magazines, uh, one of the main scientists just wrote an article last week saying that it's just, it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of time we have a Fukushima in America. Just a matter of time. I believe it. I believe it. I'm sorry, Harry, what was that? I was just saying that uh, the two together is devastating because fracking increases the chance of the breakthroughs. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, so there's there's nuclear, there's gas, and then there's coal. And coal is obviously the, the worst actor in terms of climate change, in terms of what it does to our lungs, in terms of asthma, et cetera, et cetera. And it, you know, it's, it's a major source of mercury, acid rain. And it's interesting because most of the, the coal generation that happens in New York State is in western New York. We have four plants. We got Dunkirk, we got um, AES, we've got the Jamestown plant. Uh, so we are in kind of the hot seat. If we're going to replace coal, we can really be hurt um, economically. We need to figure out a good transition away from coal. Cassie? And on that purple section of the two cents for nuclear, yeah. the volume of that section is yeah. the same as the volume of coal that's being generated yeah. in the United States. That's how much nuclear produces? Yeah, a, I was trying to do it at least to some extent. Yeah. Um, at this point, we get about 25% of our electricity generated from nuclear, about 25 from natural gas, about 10% from coal, which is a lot less than nat nat nationally, which is a good thing. In terms of the barrier order effect, we still have a one-step difference if you substitute it in the wind or solar. Yeah. On that block, the one that was right. Yep. Are you done? Bill? Okay. I'm almost done. So, all right. So, we need to replace those sources of energy, and the way to do it is by significantly reducing demand and by replacing them with renewables. A clean program offers us a proven and effective way to fast track the development and also to create jobs. And that's it. Point of information or just a brief announcement. Um, the next uh, the next thing on the agenda today is uh, there's dinner being served at Burning Books starting at 5:30, which is about 20 minutes from now. That's at 420 Connecticut Avenue. That's the wrong time. It's actually uh, three minutes to five right now. Okay, good. That's the wrong time. Good, excellent. But I just so I just want to let people know at 5:30, 420 Connecticut Avenue, six o'clock is when the program begins. Keep going. Fifteen. I just wanted to know how much, uh, how many jobs are there in Western New York that depend on coal? I don't. I don't know. 
you know, it's largely with established plants that probably don't take too many people to run them at this point. You know, the, the, in terms of producing the sources of gas and coal, that's other states. So it's, you know, it's, it's something we need to take seriously and communities get a lot of their tax revenue to keep their things going and so on. So, you know, we need to plan and think carefully. There's a great article in the most recent Sierra Club magazine in Washington State. They actually phased out the last coal plant and they did it in combination with labor and with the community and they, everybody saw the writing on the wall and they tried to figure out how to make the best of it. Are you familiar with the um, Coal Energy Cooperative of America? But, um, it's, no. There's an arm of it right here in Buffalo, and I signed up for it, and they only, you, you can sign up to get it no matter what utility you belong to. Um, they, they, they are like the, uh, the deliverer, right. but you can sign up for where you get your power from, and this is only um, bio, um, wind and solar. Right. That's all they do. Yeah. I mean, so you can sign up for it. That's a good idea. And, and we do that, and businesses I've, I've been involved with do do that. I mean, people should check that out as an option. Um, you know, if we had a policy such as the feed-in tariff, it would, it would do a lot more than having a bunch of kind of individuals making that decision. But it's important for individuals to make that decision and to do that as well, sure. Uh, I was just something like an actionable thing you could tell us, like what, what are some, like what are a couple steps that we should take like either you know, immediately yep. or in the near yep. future. If you could please email me, I'll send you a copy of a draft letter that we've got up that you can send to folks. And I will also, if you want to get involved with the organizing work we're doing with the Sierra Club Energy Committee, I'd be happy to hook you up with that. Yeah, uh, Occupy Buffalo is all about uh, pressuring the government to make reforms that benefit the mass of the people. So whatever has been done in other states, we need to find out because we need to do it again. Oh. Um, is there, you mentioned up there, I know Ontario does a lot of community uh, renewable energy projects. Can you give an example of how a community energy project is done and what uh, locally, for example, Buffalo or our community in Western New York could do? For example, a community-owned wind farm, a community-owned solar power plant? Sure. I mean, ideally we would have a renewable energy co-op and that's what they have in Toronto. There is a, a wind turbine on the Toronto waterfront that was set up that generates power that also is a good kind of shining example that everybody in the city can see, plus they've got all kinds of information at its base about how it works. In addition to which, they've now set up this solar share thing. So there could be a co-op that's set up, you know, that pools people and in, people's investments. And one of the things that I was thinking is, for example, when they just expanded the, the project out on the waterfront, that, you know, local folks could have owned one of those turbines and the output for those turbines. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we could create a financial vehicle. There's also a, a national organization kind of springing up out of Washington called the Community Power Network uh, Washington, out of Washington, D.C., and they've done a lot of looking at how to get a bunch of people together. You know, many people have homes that you can't really put solar on the roof, but if, you know, 10 or 20 different neighbors got together and put it up, you know, in front of the library where it's open to the to the sun all day and then they own that power. You know, there, there's ways of making that happen. So a cooperative, you could, you, could, you could create an energy cooperative just amongst people themselves and they could, they could privately own that and either sell electricity or use that electricity. Right, and it's more difficult in the United States as I, you probably know and any of us who have been involved with the food co-ops, you know, the, the laws and the, and the framework makes it difficult, but it could happen. Any other questions? Do you think that the Europeans, in particular the, the uh, Germans, had, a, had it a little bit easier in developing this green technology because of the fact that they were, were able to get some Greens elected to Parliament or even the party of European Socialists in the European Parliament? Ab absolutely, and thanks for bringing that up. I mean, you know, at this point in Germany, this program has lived through several successive regimes, you know, and it went through kind of the, the equivalent of our Democrats, and now they have the equivalent of our Republicans in there. And they're still increasing the damn program and making it happen and being committed to it because it makes so much sense. But it was the Green Party that started it there. And there are cities that are just, you know, in Germany that are close to 100% renewable wow. and, you know, led by Greens. And it's, 
that kind of leadership is really important. Melissa. Thank you very much, Bill. I, I think that like the thing that most people are just ignoring is the first step of reducing. If you just look in this room, you can see a whole bunch of opportunities to reduce energy use on a very micro level. But I'm curious about if you could speak to what kind of policy um, efforts there are on a wide scale level to you know, encourage people to reduce their use of energy because we're so yeah. overly wasting energy well, in I, our culture. I mean, something really good did happen. It happened through the Working Family Center and efforts of environmental mentalists all across New York State, and that is the Green Jobs and Green New York program. And at this point, they're, they're making, they're using the money from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative to make that available to people to do renew, uh, energy efficiency improvements in their home. And you're actually able at this point, because of further legislation that was passed, to put that on your utility bills. So it's not like you need to put money up front. You can pay it off over time on your utility bill. And, you know, the idea is you would have less total cost and you can just spread it out. What about like are there any like efforts like from the state education department to put it into curricula in public schools? I, I'm you sure know, there are that kind of thing. I mean like it's Yeah. I, I don't know. You know there's there's a group that had their convention here of environmental educators last year. They'd be able to tell you I haven't tracked it. Obviously they're not doing enough because we're not hearing about it, but there's probably is something and it's probably not enough. Okay, Chris, then uh, that would be the last person that we have to uh, pack up and go. Anybody here right? Oh, um, to, yeah, yeah I mean, let me say something before Chris yeah. starts. Like, we could use some help putting away chairs. We'd like to really help them out. Okay. That chair's up in the back of the room. And let's make sure that uh, people who need rides get them before we do that. Okay. okay, Chris, and then we'll finish up. It's probably environmentally sound that we carpool over there. Um, just to supplement what Melissa's saying is, uh, we have individual Melissa. rights. Melissa, I'm sorry. Melissa. 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 We have individual rights that's, that is superior to collective responsibility. You know, so we don't have like a communal collective ethics. Because in this our culture we have, uh, I have a right to do this, you know? And it's hard to like change that, so changing that mentality. So I'm wondering like, uh, you know, the philosophers in the room, maybe, uh, we can start thinking about this as well. Hmm. Can we legislate morality, for instance? <laughs> if, if it's this isn't too hard to understand. Most people can appreciate that you don't cut off your nose to spite your face. An individual person saying, or I'll be damned, I'm gonna do what I want, is cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's not highfalutin like philosophical. It's straightforward. So to finish, we need to advocate for, yes, using less energy, and while we're doing that, pushing for legislators who are gonna make sure we get green jobs. It's not it's not rocket science, y'all. <laughs> so let's 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 bring the chairs together and let's um Can I say one thing? Yeah, please. Sir. Um I'm gonna be doing another talk on geothermal in, in March. And uh, I'm involved with a company called Buffalo Geothermal. It's a great technology. You talk about not doing hydro fracking. This replaces natural gas for heating your home. So just to give people kind of a, a teaser on that, it should be good.